Excuse me for a dog. Hi guys. It is a frosty winter night in mid-November. That would be Monday night, November 14, 2022. And so even though it is a Monday, we are going to give it the old second try. Uh, this was my Sunday Doomsday Sermon last night, but as some of you may know, uh, <laughs> didn't work out that way. We had a little collapse of global industrial civilization on this camera. Uh, but I want to thank a very kind-hearted listener, Fred Baker, for sending me this fine new camera. Fred actually sent me this camera a year ago when my last piece of crap camera collapsed, but uh, I got this one before Fred sent me his, so unbelievably, Fred, uh, your camera has been sitting in the box for a year, and I am actually quite thrilled. I think we have a brand new, better camera, so uh, I'm learning how to use this uh, new camera so guys, let me know what you think about the video and audio quality and whatnot. But thank you, Fred. <coughs> so there will not be, I thought there was going to be like a week or two break in Collapse Chronicles, but the show must go on. So anyway, uh, as you may be aware, for some reason the bean counters are claiming that tomorrow, tomorrow, November 15th, 2022, that this planet is going to hit 8 billion people, 8 billion human beings, uh, as we all try to uh, see how many humans we can stuff on the planet, because that seems to be what most people consider to be the highest and best use of a planet. So, uh, of course, uh, I am enjoying all of the overpopulation denial showing up on the mainstream media to uh, mark this uh, horrific milestone. Will this be the last time we add a billion people? Are we going to make it to 9 billion, uh, 10 billion, 12 billion? Uh, <coughs> That is the 8 billion human question. But in preparation for that, I want to thank my uh, good buddy Fat Boy for sending me this. Uh, I guess it's a, an ebook. I, I don't know where he got the link from, so I'm a little bit uh, leery of just publishing the link. So, what I've decided to do. Uh, is after hearing, I'm, I'm going to read a little bit from the first chapter, and if you want to hear more from this book, just send me an email at collapsechronicles at gmail.com, and I will send you the link. I don't want to run afoul of any copyright uh, although I don't even think there is a copyright notice on this. But anyway, this is a brand new ebook. Excuse me, little dog. You go get that mousey like that. Uh, came out eight days ago by a fellow whose name I vaguely recognize, John Scales Avery. John Scales Avery, you might know him. He's one of these big peace, world peace activists, uh, you know, anti-nuclear -nuc world peace activist. Uh, but that's not really what he's talking about in his new book. But while he's not uh, protesting for peace, the 80, now 89-year-old John Scales Avery is a theoretical chemist noted for his research publications in quantum chemistry, thermodynamics, evolution, and the history of science. He was educated at MIT, the University of Chicago, and Imperial College of London. 
And anyway, uh, John, for whatever reason, has come down here in the Doomosphere. He is a Doomer now, although he wouldn't call himself that. In his brand new book, We Are Demanding Too Much. We Are Demanding Too Much. And this is about a 200-page book. I'm going to read this short little uh, intro and some passages from the first chapter. And how he, now, I, I will, I mean, a little bit of a spoiler alert. Uh, John, uh, while he does understand the problem, he is still, even someone as brilliant as this man, is still buying into the bright green lies that renewable energy is going to save the planet, although he does realize we're going to have to mine the planet to save the planet. Even with that acknowledgement, I guess he still supports it. But anyway, we're not going to get into the hopium. We're going to stick with some of his comments on population <clears throat> because John Scales Avery at least has the balls to talk about it, unlike anybody else. Uh, out there. So, uh, and, and where he starts the, his book, the first graph he has is the famous hockey stick graph, where I've mentioned this, and I know if you're a doomer you've seen it, where plotting, you, you know, fossil fuels against, you know, the hockey stick, where the population of humans went like this and shot through the roof right about the same time that fossil fuels came into uh, being. Imagine that. <clears throat> so this is his, uh, the way he jumps into his book, We Are Demanding Too Much. A graph showing the explosive rise of human population when the global population of humans is plotted as a function of time over a period of 12,000 years, and the use of fossil fuels is plotted on the same plot as is shown in the graph above, well, you know what the graph looks like, the two curves are seen to rise abruptly and simultaneously during the last two or three centuries. In the graph, one sees, uh, well, anyway, he explains what you're looking at, but we know what we're looking at. The use of fossil fuels will stop in a few centuries. <laughs> we, we will see about this, brother, whether the use of fossil fuels will stop in a few centuries because of depleted resources, but it must stop much more abruptly if catastrophic climate changes to, a, to a, be avoided. The graph raises the question of whether human population is headed for a crash in the post-fossil fuel era, and this is you know, coming back to a discussion I've, I've had several times recently. I talked about it when I was interviewing uh, Robert Jensen recently, <clears throat> you know, about how global agriculture, you know, industrial, global industrial civilizations, agriculture is 100% dependent on fossil fuels. And one of the main reasons the population and the fossil fuels is like this is because of that. And if you just stop fossil fuels, as all of these clueless morons are talking about, just stop them, well, what's going to happen is if you pull the fossil fuel carpet out from under humanity, probably one half of the planet will be dead in less than six months. This is the conundrum we are in. 
And uh, so I think uh, the question has an obvious answer. We are demanding more from nature than nature can restore. Do you think so? <clears throat> Until the agricultural revolution and later the industrial revolution, you know, and then, of course, the industrial agriculture revolution, humans were few in number and lived in balance with nature. Okay, I, I, I'm not sure what he meant by that sentence. I'm giving the man the benefit of the doubt that what he meant to say there were so few humans that we, you know, while we were still able to take out, you know, like uh, 15 genre of uh, megafauna uh, in uh, here in Turtle Island uh, 13,000 years ago. There, there's a great balance in nature. What he trying to say, and I don't even believe this, is, is that humans were just too few in number to make that big of a difference. I don't, well, maybe this man is a, suffers from the myth of the noble savage. A lot of times, peaceniks tend to be lefties. So peaceniks buying into the bright green lies, he probably does suffer some hilarious myth that humans ever lived in balance with nature. Humans are the biggest, uh, you know, bad apple upsetting the apple cart in the history of the planet. If there's one human on the planet, he or she will be living out of balance with nature. Can you say Kiwanaskotsi? You know, the Hopis are uh, some of the noble savages that I'm okay with. Anyway, I'm getting off track. Imagine that. Back to John's sermon. <coughs> After that hilarious comment about humans living in balance with nature. However, in recent centuries, humans have exploded in numbers. The global population will reach 8 billion in 2022, possibly tomorrow. My guess is we probably flew past 8 billion five or six years ago, but nobody knows. Call it tomorrow. In order to feed such an enormous population, vast areas of forest have been cut down and converted to farmland. Nevertheless, food prices are starting to rise rapidly and many parts of the world are threatened with famine as glaciers melt in the Himalayas, depriving India and China of summer water supplies, as sea levels rise, drowning the fertile rice fields of Vietnam and Bangladesh's droughts threaten the productivity of grain producing regions of North America, and the end of the fossil fuel era impacts modern high yield agriculture there is a threat of widespread famine involving not millions of people, but billions, which again is exactly what is going to happen if we just stop fossil fuels. In order to achieve a sustainable society and to avoid a catastrophic population crash, now again, he's assuming that it's a good thing to avoid a catastrophic population crash. So assuming you want to uh, avoid a catastrophic population crash, we must strive to state we must strive to stabilize and later reduce human numbers. We must also strive to live more modestly and to reduce our demands. Now, of course, I could uh, 
do one of my ain't gonna happen John retorts to this. Uh, we are not voluntarily going to strive to stabilize and reduce our numbers. And we sure as hell are not going to strive to live more modestly and to reduce our demands. Uh, ain't gonna happen, uh, ain't gonna happen. Uh, but anyway, again, I'm just going to, his chapter one is called, is titled Addiction to Growth. And he attributes that uh, saying, that I've always heard it as, uh, you know, about, uh, we, we've all heard it. Uh, what, what is the version I have heard, if you believe it, in uh, infinite growth on a finite planet, you must be either a madman or an economist or 99% of the population. But he attributes that famous quote to some fellow named Kenneth Boulding, and the quote is, anyone who believes in indefinite growth uh, in anything physical on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. So I guess 99% of the humans on the planet are either mad or economists, or quite possibly both. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Uh, I don't want to... I got all into this crazy equation talking about hyperbolas and stuff. I want to... I don't want to lose you with that, so uh, I'm going to edit my rant from last night. So let me figure out. Anyway, I'm just going to have to read around it. Today, we are able to estimate the population of the world at various periods in history, and we can also make estimates of global population in prehistoric times. Looking at the data, we can see that the global population of humans, uh, oh boy, has followed a hyperbolic trajectory. And then I'm not going to get in, into all of the technical math about what uh, a hyperbolic trajectory uh, it is compared to an exponential curve. It's too many people growing too fast is what it is. Uh, <clears throat> so at the time of Christ, the population of the world is believed to have been approximately 220 million. By 1500, the earth contained 450 million people. And by 17. 50, the global population exceeded 700 million. But you can still see it took 1,750 years to go, you know, to add less than a half a billion. But as the industrial and scientific revolutions has accelerated, global population has responded by increasing at breakneck speed. And then, of course, uh, we've heard it all before. In 1930, the population of the world reached 2 billion. 1958, 3 billion. 1974, 4 billion. 1988, 5 billion. 1999, 6 billion. And uh, blah, blah, blah. And here we are looking at 8. Uh, he skipped over when we hit seven. Um, roughly a billion people are being added to the world's population every 12 years. Uh, we're not going to talk about physicist Murray Gell Mann, but let's talk about Malthus, my hero Malthus. 
how are we to explain the fact that the population curve uh, is, well, it, it's, it's hyperbolic, it's, it's, it's hockey stick, okay? How are we to explain the fact that the population curve looks like a hockey stick? I'm oversimplifying here. <clears throat> we can turn to Malthus for an answer. According to his model, population does not increase exponentially except under special circumstances when the food supply is so ample that the increase of population is entirely unchecked. Malthus gives us a model of culturally driven population growth. He tells us that population, population increase tends to press against the limits of the food supply, and since these limits are culturally determined, population density is also culturally determined. Hunter-gatherer societies needed large tracts of land for their support, and in such societies, the population density is necessarily low. And we don't have to get into the overkill hypothesis talking about how the hunter-gatherer societies, you know, with clubs and spears, uh, took out uh, a, a wide swath of their fellow earthlings. Pastoral methods of food production can support populations of a higher density, finally extremely high densities of population can be supported by modern agriculture, modern agriculture meaning agriculture 100% dependent on fossil fuels. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, okay, I'm going to steer around all of this stuff. I, I, you know, the, the, the writing style is a little uneven. He goes back and forth uh, where, he's, where he's talking to like a, you know, a popular or a lay audience or whatever. And then he gets into all of these weird mathematical formulas to make your eyes roll back in your head, so uh, a, a little bit uneven. I'm trying to read around this. Okay, leaving the hyperbola behind. Because of the great amount of human suffering which may be involved, yes, may be involved, and the potentially catastrophic, nothing potential about it, it's already here, the catastrophic damage to the Earth's environment, the question of how the actual trajectory of human population will come to deviate from the hyperbola is a matter of enormous importance. Will population overshoot the sustainable limit, which we've already done, and crash, yes, it will. Because we're halfway, we've already reached the first half of the sentence, uh, and crash. Or will it gradually approach, gradually approach, you know, a hyperbolic hop hockey stick, you know, that kind of gradually approach, yes, uh, or will it gradually approach a maximum? In the case of the second alternative, will the checks which slow population growth be later marriage and family planning? No, they won't. Or 
will the grim Malthusian forces, famine, disease, and war act to hold the number of humans within the carrying capacity of their environment. Yes, it will. We can anticipate that the Earth's human population, that as the Earth's human population approaches 10 billion people, severe famines will occur in many developing countries. The beginnings of this tragedy can already be seen. It is now estimated that roughly 30,000 children die every day from starvation or from a combination of disease and malnutrition. And of course, he's got like 700 footnotes uh, at the end of each chapter, you know, citing his sources. <clears throat> okay, so what's it going to look like beyond the fossil fuel era? An analysis of the global ratio of population to cropland shows that we have probably already exceeded the sustainable limit of population through our dependence on petroleum. Yes, between 1950 and 1982, I don't know why he chose a date 40 years ago, why he couldn't get a little more recent than 40 years ago, but anyway, between 1950 and 1982, the use of cheap synthetic fertilizers